You may remember when we first got started that I told you how like if you wanted to cook a chicken a whole chicken and cook it real slow what would you use you would use a crock pot right and you remember I told you how the ancient Egyptians invented crock pots and I showed you this clay pot that was decorated with crocodiles all over it that's supposed to be funny <laughs> well tonight I'm going to show you how the ancient Egyptians invented fishnets fishnet stockings <laughs> well that was funny, wasn't it? Well, well you see, you'll, 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 get, you'll be laughing again. Okay, we're talking tonight about the fables, and these fables are generally taken from the hieroglyphic trans, 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 um, interpretations, not, uh, not the translations, but interpretations, um, from papyrus drawings and pictures painted on papyrus and some from uh, tomb walls as well, painted on tomb walls. Incidentally, we talked uh, last week, I believe, about the secret codes that uh, the Pharaoh had to know the answers to questions once he died and was mummified and he was being examined to see whether he would earn eternal life or not. Uh, and to make sure that he remembered those codes, they were chiseled into the walls of his stone tomb so he wouldn't forget them. And when uh, years went by and it got uh, too expensive to do that, they painted them on the walls. In some cases, uh, they were, uh, I have so many diver divergent uh, pathways that I want to talk about here, but uh, in some cases they were painted on the tomb walls. Uh, and when that got to be too expensive, they just wrote it on papyrus, rolled it up into a scroll, and threw it in the, into the wooden coffin which was placed into the stone sarcophagus with the guy so he would remember the, the codes. The uh, thought that crossed my mind there while I was in the middle of some other thought was I was going to point out to you that in some cases uh, stone walls are incised, that is the carvings are dug into the stone. In other cases they are what the, uh, there's an Italian term for this, it's basso relievo, which means the base is relieved so the figures stand out from a flat base. And the reason for this is that uh, generally, not entire, not all the time, but generally when they are incised, they're cut in, this is in an outdoor structure, the side, the outside wall of a temple or uh, some sort of a monument. Uh, when basal relievo is used and, and the base is cut off to a flat plane whereas the letters are sort of standing out, that is generally done in an underground tomb and the reason for this is that uh, the incised letters that are cut in uh, occur on the outsides of tombs above ground because the sunlight comes from many different directions to cast a little shadow either morning or even in evening in that cut up space and makes it more visible. Um, in the tombs where it's very very dark light comes from only one source and that's the torch or the candle of the guy that's that's going in there so the light will uh, hit the, the raised part and leave a shadow on the far side and therefore make it stand out better. So the technique is used to, to advantage uh, in the dark uh, by basal relievo and in the light time by incised uh, cutout uh, things. That's not really relevant except that when I was talking to you about paintings on tomb walls I remembered that fact and I thought you might be interested in knowing why some are incised and some are basal relievo. In, in any event, these fables, uh, you're going to find some of them really quite uh, bizarre. But uh, we are looking at these from 2017, uh, when we might be looking at them from 2017 years before Christ. And that is a time period from which these uh, fables are extracted. Uh, so while things look very strange to us, like magic, like uh, uh, a human turning himself into a hawk or whatever, uh, this was, these things were part of their religion and they believed these things as much as, uh, as, much as uh, a guy who uh, straps uh, explosives around his uh, waist and figures he's going to get into heaven by doing some uh, deed like that. 
it's a belief. And a tale of true brothers is a tale of treachery. Remember, this is a series on the women of ancient Egypt. So in each of the fables, there is a woman uh, featured, uh, sometimes more than, more than one woman. The scribe Anina, hieroglyphs that he wrote on a papyrus, I believe it was on a papyrus, are now, that papyrus is now in the British Museum. Okay, the story goes like this. There are two brothers. One of them is named Anubis, and one of them is named Bata, B-A-T-A. They live in the same house. Uh, Anubis, Anubis is married and he has a wife. Ba Baba is a, Bata is a younger guy. He, he does not have a wife. And actually, he's kind of like uh, the, the second-hand guy on the farm. Uh, Anubis is the principal uh, guy who uh, leads. He's the older brother. And Bada is a helper. Now, one of the things Bada is responsible for is taking care of the cows, the cattle. Okay. Uh, and he, in doing this job, he has gotten to where he really understands them. He talks to them. You know, today, cowboys sing to cows, you know. Um, so Bada was good at that. And, and they, in turn, would show him where the good grass is because they kind of move off towards the good grass. And he'd say, oh, yeah, over there. Yeah, we'll go over there. Anubis stood as a father to his younger brother, who acted as a general handyman. Bada bears the brunt of the farming work. One day they were planting and they ran out of seeds, and so Anubis sent his younger brother back to the house to get some, some more seed. And he finds his brother's wife braiding her hair, and she, he says, would you, would you mind getting me some seeds? And she says, look, don't bother me. I'm, I'm putting on my makeup, you know, it's now, so don't bother me. <laughs> Yeah, so he, she says, you go get the seed yourself. And he says, all right. So uh, he goes over and uh, climbs up on it, gets the highest, the heaviest bag off the top, puts it on his shoulder and comes down. Of course, he's naked from the waist down and wearing this kind of kilt. And she decides, wow, well, that guy's got muscles. And uh, she puts her, his, her hand on his arm. She's saying, hey, it's a good opportunity for us to spend an hour together. Well, Bada, he's, his mind is going to seed. That's a little joke. Anyway, he says, no, no, we can't do that. Um, that's, that's, uh, not the, our moral teaching is that that's, that's sinful, even to think such a thing. He lives with, like a son with her and his older brother, and he promises that the matter, will, you know, this will go no farther. We're not going to talk about this anymore. So uh, he goes back, uh, takes his heavy bag of seed back to the fields. In the evening, uh, he sets off to bring in the cattle, and uh, sle he sleeps in the stable uh, with, the, with the cattle. Uh, so uh, before Anubis gets back, uh, his wife decides she's going to get even with Bata. And uh, she uh, tears her clothes and she's eating a bunch of fatty food, so she's throwing up and she's crying, tears are running down her face, and she says, he raped me, you know. Well, uh, this is kind of a problem for the big brother and he's really getting quite angry now. She challenges Anubis to kill his brother Bata, or else she will die. Anubis becomes very angry and, uh, and uh, he hides behind the stable, so he's gonna kill his brother, his younger brother. He's got a knife back there. Well, uh, when the, when the Bata is leading the cows into the stable, uh, the first cow says, uh, hey, uh, uh, we got a little problem here. Uh, I can see Anubis' foot behind the door, and he's got a knife in his hand, and uh, he's going to kill you. And uh, Bata says, are you sure about that? And the first cow says, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, so the second cow says, yeah, well, there's, I see it too. I see. Well, Bata sees, eventually sees the Anubis' feet under the door, and he uh, runs off, and Anubis goes after him in hot pursuit, a dagger up in the air. Bata prays to Ra for help. So Ra creates a great lake full of crocodiles and keeps Bata safe until the morning. And in the morning, Bata calls across to Anubis. He wants to talk to him and tell him, tell him what happened. Uh, here in this, uh, painting from the ceiling of a beautiful tomb. Uh, you'll remember that the uh, hippopotamus is the uh, female uh, god of fertility and her husband is Sobek, the, the uh, crocodile god. Uh, he says, he says, I'm going to tell you, Anubis, I'm going to tell you what exactly what happened. Uh, and I'm going to prove it by, by cutting off an important part of my body and throwing it to the crocodiles. 
So uh, next morning, uh, he says, well, uh, since you don't trust me anymore, I, I'm, I'm leaving town. I'm, uh, I'm going off and uh, uh, live in the valley of the acacia trees. Uh, and I'm going to put my soul, the ba, B-A. He put his soul up in the, in the acacia tree. Uh, and that uh, Anubis would know he was in trouble uh, if his beer turned cloudy, his evening beer turned cloudy. Anubis would then come looking for him and place his ba soul in a cup of water so that he might live again. You could buy these things uh, in Walmart. They're little spongy-like things, throw them in water and grow right up. So they're still happening like that today. You might try that and see if your soul gets rejuvenated. Bada went away and lived in the desert. When the gods saw that he was alone, they asked Kanum, Kanum, the god uh, who has the uh, head of a ram and he has kind of curled horns, twisted horns. Um, and he was one of several creator gods. Uh, I've forgotten the exact town where he was worshipped as a creator god, but, but he was a creator god as a potter and he created life on a, on a potter's wheel. That was the, the, one of the seven or eight different theories of creation that you find in the ancient uh, Egyptian literature. And it's easy to believe that if you've ever watched somebody uh, 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 work with a potter's wheel. Uh, I was on a little barge going down a canal in Egypt one time and there was a potter doing an exhibition on the bank and he was using a kick wheel, so he was kicking this wheel down below to make his wheel up top turn. And he had almost finished this uh, beautiful little pitcher-shaped pot, and he um, cut a piece off of turning clay into a rope and, and made a, a little handle to put on the side of this thing. And you, you watch somebody doing it like that, and you could see how somebody would believe that the Almighty had created life on a potter's wheel, because potters are creative people. So. Uh, the gods saw that he was alone, and uh, they made a wife for him, and she was more beautiful than anyone. The only, uh, only problem was, uh, she was more beautiful than anyone. I think I've missed a line here some. The problem was that the, the god failed to give her a good heart. So she, uh, but the seven cows of Hathor said she will die a sharp death because uh, Kanum, the potter, failed to give her a good, a good heart. Now, it looks like there are eight cows uh, in this drawing here, but one of them is a bull. So the, the, the seven cows, the legend of the seven cows is that they will foretell the fate of the male, next male child of the Pharaoh. Every day Bada went uh, hunting for food, but he was afraid uh, to go near the river because he was afraid. Uh, he, he did not want his wife to go near the river because he was afraid the crocodiles or the river god, Hapi, would, uh, would eat her. She would, she would uh, drown. So uh, Hapi tried to catch her with a wave but got only a lock of her hair. Now that was important because uh, God had given her very sweet smelly hair and here a lock of it had uh, been snapped off and was in the water floating down the river. This hair was scented with the sweet perfumes since it was made from the essence of the gods. Floated down the river where it was found by the king's women who were washing his clothes. The chief fuller, uh, I believe a fuller is somebody who weaves cloth. The, the chief fuller took it to the king since it made the clothes smell so sweet and it must have come from the daughter of the gods. So the king decided he'd like to meet this woman who this lock goes with. So he sent his messengers to all parts of the land to find her. All of these messengers returned empty-handed, except one. One of them did not come back. That's telling. Why did that one not come back? So, okay, the king's soldier was killed by Bada. Uh, they, they, actually, the, so, the king's soldiers killed Bada and took the girl to the king. He was delighted with her and made her one of his wives. Now Anubis's beer turns cloudy. New chapter in the story. Uh, and knew that Bada was in trouble. In the valley of the acacias, he found Bada dead on his mat and his soul in an acacia tree. Anubis put the soul in a cup of water and when Bada had sucked up all the water, he shook his limbs and Anubis uh, and uh, told Anubis all that had happened to him. 
Then Bada said, I'm going to turn myself into a great bull. Take me to the king so that I may get rough with my wife for going near the river, losing a lock of her hair and causing all this trouble. So Bada became a bull and Anubis rode on his back to the palace. The king wanted this prized bull, paid Anubis gold and silver to, to buy the bull. The king was made offerings to the bull and was pleased. One day when Bada's former wife came to the purified place, the bull spoke to her and said, yeah, you know who I am, don't you? I'm your husband that you got rid of and caused all this trouble with. She said, who are you? He said, I am Bada. She became alarmed and cast about to find a way to destroy him. She pleaded, pleased with the king, and he promised he would do anything, she asked. So she asked for the liver of the bull, rotic of the turkey buzzard. Um, the, the ancient Egyptians worshipped her as a protector, woman protector of uh, children and uh, orphans and so forth. Once upon a time, uh, Ramses the Great, Horus, son of the sun, these are various titles. These are titles of Ramses the Great. Ramses the Great. Horus, son of the sun god, mighty with scimitar, smiter of the nine bow barbarians. It's common for a pharaoh to have five names. Uh, and most of the time, one of those names is beloved of Mott. Do you remember Mott? Mott was the woman who has a feather in her headdress. And she is the goddess of uh, truth, righteousness, and order the way things ought to be. And so the Pharaoh, when, particularly when he sits in judgment of a dispute between his peasants or something like that, wants to decide things as judiciously and fairly as he possibly can. So he wears this title, Beloved of Mott. I believe in order, truth, and the way things ought to be, and so forth, righteousness. The king of Syria, the princes of Becton, the prince of Becton. Uh, well, he was collecting uh, the annual tributes from the king of Syria, the prince of Becton. Prince brought many gifts uh, to the king, and his uh, his eldest daughter was also brought. She was very beautiful, and the pharaoh uh, fell in love with her, and, and she became his his royal wife. Years later, the prince reappeared uh, at Thebes, which is the the name of uh, the town that is now called Luxor. Uh, on the east side of the Nile across from the Valley of the Kings and the Land of the Dead. Uh, and he said, I got a real problem. Uh, uh, my, my daughter is sick. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, I sure wish you would um, send me a, a, a doctor who can, who can help her. A great scribe and doctor was sent and he found the, the Princess Becton I was uh, possessed of a demon. He advised the prince to ask the pharaoh for a, for a, or a god to fight this uh, for God to fight this demon, and the pharaoh sent the god Khonsu, expeller of demons, provider and protector. When Khonsu entered the chamber of Ventrekshet, he made a magical uh, protection over her, and in a moment she was well. Khonsu then ordered the demon um, to return from whence uh, he had come. The evil demon addressed Khonsu and saying, uh, Peace be with you, O oh, Almighty One. Uh, this land is yours, uh, your possession, and I may, uh, and I'm sure, so just so as you desire, I will return to the place from where I came. But first let the Prince of Becton hold uh, a great feast in my honor. It's going to be my goodbye going away party. Great, with great dread fell upon the, uh, the people, but the, then the demon took its departure and returned to whence it came, according to the desires of Khonsu, the giver of oracles, an exorcist. And there was great rejoicing. The prince was joyful of heart, and he desired that Khonsu should, be, should remain in the land for a while, and as it happened, the image of the God stayed in the land for over uh, three years. This uh, phrase, the image of the God, is uh, revealing in that they believed that uh, a little statue or a large statue of a God, a carving of a God, could be the residing place for the spirit of that God. And in many cases, the carvings like that 
uh, were not meant as pieces of art, but were meant with a functional purpose. They were going to sit in a niche in a uh, uh, wall, if, or if, if it's in the back of a house, of a poor man's house, it might have been a very small statue carved out of wood. Uh, and in the, the uh, Pharaoh's palace, it might have been a very large uh, stone carving. But none of that was done for the sake of art. It was done for a function. It was for a function. It, the function was that the man who, uh, or woman, who praised that God would stand in front of that God and recite, recite uh, memorized uh, passages um, in praise of that God. So they were not made to look at, they were made to worship. And, and people believed that the spirit of the God would reside in that statue, not necessarily all of the time, but that was a resting place for the spirit of, of that God. And so you see that the poor man who has a small uh, wooden carving of Amun, and the rich man who has a great gold-plated uh, uh, statue of Amun, uh, those two statues serve the exact same fun function. So it's not a matter of who, who's got money and who hasn't. It's a matter of their belief about their religion. Okay, anybody have any questions about anything we talked about so far? Okay, I'll give you a test. <laughs> who gave you your shadow? <laughs> oh. You win. <laughs> the sun god. The sun god gave you your shadow. To be your protector and to be with you, your companion always. And uh, um, sometimes uh, your shadow in hieroglyphs is referred to as shades. Uh, your shade. Uh, you remember this weighing of the heart ceremony where after mummification your heart uh, is weighed on this dual pan balance. Uh, against the very light feather of Mott, the goddess of truth and justice. And if it is weighed down by dirty deeds, you're not going to get eternal life uh, after you're dead. Uh, and your heart is going to be eaten by Amit, the, the monster who has the head of a crocodile, body of a hippopotamus, and the tail of a lion, I think. Sometimes he is known as the swallower of shades, which you interpret uh, as he eats your ba, your part of your soul uh, that is represented by your shadow or your shade. So, okay, let's see where we're going. Uh, dating and courtship were unstructured. Men and women fell in love. There was nothing, uh, there was no role for the government in, uh, in uh, marriage. Um, they had families, they worried about the children, they worked and struggled and sought security and had moral codes. Uh, deviates from the moral code became criminals. Life was typical. The young played with toys while the oh, remember we saw some to toys, mechanical toys last week uh, that you could pull strings on and make them uh, move and so forth. The young played with the toys and older children and adults played games. They competed in sports, partied, danced, sang and rejoiced and were sad when death took a loved one and were proud appropriately sued each other and divorced and paid taxes and fought with neighbors. Now all of this information comes from, uh, much of it, not all of it, but much of it comes from uh, papyrus, um, hieroglyphic writings. Those uh, papyrus scrolls um, lasted so long because uh, they were, the papyrus, in order to have it last long, papyrus has a certain amount of sugar in the plant and all of that sugar has got to be washed out of a strip uh, otherwise uh, microbes will take over if there's even the least uh, trace of moisture but if you get all the sugar out, washed out of it before you lay it out and dry it out to where it becomes a sheet it is thought that papyrus was the uh, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for, for a progenitor of paper um, it was, it, 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 the, the writing on flat stuff came from papyrus to, um, I, I think, uh, animal skins and then cloth and eventually paper. Uh, I'm not sure about that evolution, but uh, somewhere I read uh, something to that effect. 
So, the, but the but the, the scrolls, once they were decorated and the hieroglyphs were written on them, lasted forever because the desert was so dry. The desert was deliquescent; it sucked the moisture out of everything. And without moisture, there is no no decay, uh, uh, at least not not. Uh, bacterial decay there may be some uh, if 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 the papyrus drawings uh, had seen sunlight and air un un unlimited sunlight and air they probably would have been destroyed within 500 to 1000 years uh, i don't know how many of you are aware of it but i have a phd in organic chemistry so i, I tend to think of things in chemical terms uh, and the environment, for instance, I know that the eastern half of the United States has acidic soil. And the western half of the United States has basic soil. Those two types of chemicals neutralize each other. If you take a Corvette body or a fiberglass boat body and you bury it anywhere east of the Mississippi, uh, they'll probably stay there a long time. You bury it out uh, towards the desert and the alkali areas where there's some moisture rain every 10 years or so. So, if you get all the sugar out of the, the papyrus plant, if you cut across the stalk, it has a triangular uh, cross section. And so you strip off the green outside and you end up with a sort of a pithy material on the inside. You slice it, actually you can kind of peel it, and um, the, the slices will get smaller and smaller as you go across that triangle. But you lay those out and you got to wash them to, walk, to get all the sugar out of them. And then you may want to interlace them before you dry them out and so forth. Uh, but if you get them prepared properly, they'll last a long, long time. Now, if they're out in the sun where uh, they can see sun and air, sun is uh, the damaging part of sun, light is ultraviolet uh, light. And ultraviolet light and oxygen from the air form uh, free radicals, which will actually cause cancer and cause all kinds of damage if they happened to hit the wrong place at the wrong time. So uh, scrolls that were buried in tombs or in a wooden coffin carved and decorated elaborately done uh, wooden coffin and put inside a stone sarcophagus and incidentally that's the way the latter burials were done. If you just put a body, mummified body, in a stone sarcophagus uh, the body won't last long. Uh, the word sarcophagus is Greek for flesh eater and that's because the uh, chemicals in the stone attack the body so they won't attack wood so they put uh, mummified the body put it in a wood coffin put the wood coffin in the sarcophagus the sarcophagus was a great protection from physical things like cave-ins and whatnot sued each other that's what got me off on the papyruses uh, the papyruses record uh, trials and uh, wills and uh, prenuptial agreements and uh, all kinds of uh, pseudo-legal uh, parts of life. Divorces, they paid taxes, fought with neighbors and wives, and believed in the golden rule. Homosexual love was rare. Spell 125 of the Book of the Dead. This is one of the verses of the negative confession. I have not committed homosexuality. It's one of, one of the negative um, 41 things that the dead person has to say, I did not do these things, you know. Like, I did not fail to take care of the orf orphans and widows. Love poems, current, concerned with young loves, fantasy or social reality. Some uh, are specifically erotic, and some were puns of sex. Unmarried couples enjoyed intercourse. Themes are physical love, but poems are good uh, entertainment. But are they a guide to social mores? Some poems speak, some poems, uh, the speaker is a woman, the voice is female voice. Um, some of them it's male. We're going to look at it. two examples of this. One of them is, is entitled With Candor, I Confess. And one is entitled I Went to His House. Uh, uh, with candor, I confess, a woman speaks. With both of these poems, it's, it's a woman speaking with both of these. See, we'll do with candor, I confess. Now, these poems are not, uh, they are not poems in the classical mode of having uh, rhythm and rhyme uh, or built-in quatrain uh, sets of four lines per, per verse or what have you. 
uh, they are more like free, free, freestyle poetry, which does not require rhyme or uh, rhythm. With candor I confess, a woman speaks. With candor I confess my love. I love you, yes, and wish to love you closer. As mistress of your house, your arm placed over mine, alas, your eyes are loose, I tell my heart. My Lord has moved away during the night. Your eyes are loose. I tell my heart, my Lord has moved away during the night, moved away and left me. I am like a tomb. And I wonder, is there no sensation left when you come to me? Nothing at all? Alas, those eyes which lead you astray forever on the loose. And yet I confess with candor that no matter where else they roam, if they roam towards me, I enter into life. I, I like that poem. And this one, I went to his house. I went to his house and the door was open. My beloved was at his mother's side with brothers and sisters around him. Everybody who passes has sympathy for him. An excellent boy, none like him. A friend of rare quality. He looked at me when I passed and my heart was in jubilee. If my mother knew what I am thinking, she would go to him at once. O oh, goddess of golden light, put that thought into her. Then I could visit him. I put my arms round him while people were looking and not weep because of the crowd, but would be glad that they knew it and that you know me. What a feast I would make to my goddess. My heart revolts at the thought of exit. If I could see my darling tonight, dreaming is loveliness. All right, our next series is going to be on women rulers. But